Appreciate you being here tonight. It's been such a lovely time just to reconnect with you, really. I mean, it's uh, missed you a lot. And, uh, oh, isn't that lovely? <laughs> Don't you feel warm and fuzzy? <laughs> that there but no so good to be with you and I really enjoyed that bit of worship from Philip and just lovely to be in in the presence of God here so we're going to go to John 8 uh, tonight Uh, Jim had asked to share wee bits and pieces but before we go into John 8 I just want to say a massive thank you to to all of you who've been praying you do not well I won't say you don't believe you probably do believe but you you maybe don't realize how much your prayers have been so helpful Um, We've done now two weeks of it, and I'm quite honest, we don't feel tired, which is unusual. You know, and the Bible talks about, you know, being strengthened by the prayers of the saints. I mean, God is physically doing that. I'm finding any time you have to speak, messages are coming just very easily, and you don't have to struggle with them. And there's, as as Jim said there, I mean, there's a good number of unsaved coming in regularly and coming back, which is very interesting. Um, What has been so strange, there's a couple of things I'll share maybe, and they're just unusual. Um, we've been preaching the gospel every single night. I mean, like Friday night's a case in point. And I'm saying to Brian uh, here tonight, you know, you preach on the great white throne judgment seat and you give an appeal and unsaved, you know, are there, but, you know, they're being spoken to. But it's Christians coming forward for inner healing. And it's so bizarre. And this has been coming nearly night after night. It's, it's almost as if God's dealing with brokenness. So what we're trying to learn is you, you can't orchestrate the manifestation. You just work with what God's doing. And whatever he wants to build on it, you just work with it, which has been really interesting. Throughout the week, we went, I went through a personal time just of discouragement. You just felt we'd love to see a breakthrough already. You know, a week and a half, you'd expect a breakthrough. And at the same time, Emma Jane sent a text. And it was something to the effect of the frustration you're feeling and the sense of, purposelessness is actually the enemy's feelings and there's actually pressure being put upon him and as soon as we started to pray down that line something lifted really significantly and at the same time we were praying God would you show us if there's any blockages or hindrances now this is what I'm sorry to tell you but this is what's going on it was highlighted to me that there was a Christian in the community praying for the mission to fail actually praying for it for it to end and another evangelist and myself went to visit them And we took on an attitude of humility to say to that person, you know, is there anything we've done to hurt you or done wrong to you? Um, We're sorry if we have done anything. And this person was, you know, that. But the other man with me, he just said, well, we don't want bad stuff happening here. But that's what's been sort of happening. So you sort of feel if that's going on, something else is happening, which is good. I've really enjoyed working with a man, uh, David Little. Maybe you don't. How many would have known David? Little at all, no. Well, Phil, Phil's seen him. <laughs> he's a, he, oh, did you? Oh, did you? He's a fascinating character, and I've enjoyed He's been a missionary out in Lesbos in Greece, and he's the only missionary in the whole of Greece that's allowed to evangelize in those refugee camps in Lesbos. God opened that up for him. It's amazing. But to give you a wee bit of the fun with him, it's quite, I like this story. Um, he talks about he hates bullies. He really hates bullies, he says. And he says, when I was in the faith mission, he told me, he said there was this dorms and one bigger guy was sitting on top of this younger guy and, and you know, just really wrestling him. And the younger guy was shouting, David, David, come and help me. And he says, I hate bullies. So he said, I was going to pretend to chin him, just just miss him. I was going to try to miss him. And, and he says, I went and I was, I was just going to skim his chin, but I forgot I had a steel bucket in my hand. <laughs> and I knocked him clean out. <laughs> So it hasn't been a dull moment, uh, put it like that as well. Um, the other thing that's been amazing is that there has been some responses on doors, like out of ordinary, and it's been really, really good. So thank you for praying. Please do continue to pray. There's something building, uh, something's brewing, we feel, so uh, it's really, really good. So thank you for that. So we want to go to John 8 tonight, and this is something that's just been on my heart for the past couple of weeks, and I feel it's been speaking to me. And uh, if that's okay, I'll just share it with you tonight, if, if, if you're happy enough for that. And I want to talk about breaking the power of judgment. That's what I just want to talk about, breaking the power of judgment. 
And we want to break in here at John chapter 8 and verse 11. Now, this is a very familiar story because it's the woman caught in the act of adultery that's brought before Jesus in the temple. And the Pharisees say, we need to stone this woman to death because she's committed adultery. And so we're just breaking in at the end of this where it says in verse 10, Jesus had raised himself up and he saw no one but the woman. And he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one who bears witness of myself. And the father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. So father, we thank you for your word tonight that is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. And I just pray this evening, Father, that you'll fill, Lord, not only this atmosphere with your light, but also, Lord, fill our lives with your light, that the entrance of your word would just bring new revelation. It would bring a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of lifestyle, a change of trajectory in our lives also. And we just come now and ask, Holy Spirit, for your cleansing, and you'd wash us personally in the blood of Jesus again. I pray that you would just come and fill us, Lord, And you'd undertake for us in every way. We take authority and bind in Jesus' name every demonic spirit contrary to the Holy Ghost right now. And we just loose, Lord God, the power of the cross of Jesus and the power of the resurrection right now. And pray that the Holy Spirit will just have free course just to do whatever he wants to do tonight. And I do pray in agreement with our brother who's prayed that tonight would be a night where something seminal happens. Something significant will happen in this gathering tonight, God. That, Lord, it would be a a game-changing word. Um, my Father, for individuals, and even for the hall here. And so we just pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the greatest um, barriers to intimacy with God and a person knowing God uh, personally is shame. It's shame. Uh, On Friday night, as I mentioned, there was really interesting. You speak on judgment and you think you're getting through to unsaved people and all these Christians come forward for inner healing. But there was one guy came forward, and I'm not breaking confidence by saying this, but he came forward and he said, I don't know why I'm here, and I don't know why I need prayer, but I know I need you to, to pray for me. And I said, right, well, let's just ask, seeing what God will do. And so you start to pray for him, and you sort of pray a prayer, and you feel God's helping you to pray. And I said, anything happening? And he says, is the temperature up in this place or something? The heat is absolutely unbearable. I feel this heat through my head, and... Long story short, God started bit by bit to explore areas of his brokenness that needed to be addressed. And he opened up about his struggles, about connecting with God, and he felt other Christians connected with God far better than he did. And he was all these problems. But it came down to shame. Shame was a big, big problem in this guy's life. And shame will always stop people from connecting with God. So, for example, if a person's not a Christian, um, they'll talk like this. I'm not good enough to get saved. Or God could never love somebody like me. Or somebody would say, I need to clean myself up before I come to God. And that's just the language of shame. But you take the Christian. You have a lot of Christians and they'll say things like, um, I can't pray as I should. I, I can't witness like I should. I, I can't read the Bible like somebody else has read the Bible. I, you know, I'm just a young Christian. I don't know enough or I can't do enough. And it's almost as if it's like shame is upon these people. And the Bible says that God wants to destroy the strongholds in our minds. You realize when the Bible says that we, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. For many years, I thought strongholds were pubs and nightclubs and things. 
Um, Because that's how people prayed in prayer meetings. Oh, this is a stronghold of the devil in the community. But what Paul's talking about is attitudes in people's minds. And one of the greatest castles that needs to come toppling down in your mind and mine is shame. You know, I'm not talking so much about, let's say, somebody that's been involved in some, like, scandalous lifestyle. I mean, you know, the average 5'8 goes through shame. And they feel they can't really approach God um, because of shame. Um, how many Christians have ever sat in the sin bin? <laughs> you can't pray, you can't read, you don't, you don't talk to God because you did a big whopper. Right? Isn't that how we act? And you sit there for three days stewing in it. And you think after stewing in it for three days, then God will say, right, you're, you can now talk to me. I mean, that's just ridiculous. You remember when Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the garden, you read this in Genesis 3 and 8. It talks about how God was walking in the garden. He wanted to interact with them. And it says, and Adam and Eve hid themselves from God because they were ashamed. They, they felt exposed. They felt naked. They felt unprepared. They felt that they were unworthy. And so God's presence was trying to reach them, but they felt the shame that they couldn't connect with him. And so it's the same with you and me, is that God's presence always wants to connect with us, but we're disconnecting from him because of shame. And so you might ask, well, tell me, what's shame then? What, what's that all about? Shame is the feeling of rejection. It's the fear of rejection. That's what shame is. It's, it's the fear that if you really knew me and you really saw who I am, you wouldn't love me. You would really reject me. To take an example again, the guy who came and had all these issues of shame, there was an issue rose up and he said, I've never told another soul this issue in my life. And he told us what it was and he just says, as soon as I said it, he just, this, this, this big relief. He says, it's, it's as if I broke, you know, half of the burden. And what was so lovely is he started to pray from, he was probably from a conservative evangelical background because he says, I can't stop laughing. <laughs> and he said, well, and he, and he couldn't, he was laughing all the time. And he just prayed for him. And, and he says, the heat's on me. <laughs> I'm laughing all the time. And, he, and I said, well, the Bible says when God turns your captivity, he fills your mouth with laughter. That's what he's doing with you now. And he, at the end of the time, he just said, it's like the night I got saved all over again. I just feel like a freedom has come into my life that I, I didn't know beforehand. But that was shame that God was breaking off that man's life. It was just God working with him. And so shame is whenever you and I fear that we will be rejected. It's the feeling and it's the voice inside of your head that tells you uh, you are not good enough to be loved. You know, that's what it comes down to, right? There's three types or three causes of shame typically in people's lives. The first one is this. It's, it's our sin. Our sin. Now I know today that in our sort of PC culture, people say, oh, you shouldn't feel shame about anything. But the Bible says sin produces that in us. It's our conscience that says that wasn't good. So like if I was to give you a wee scripture, uh, Romans 6, 21, Paul says this. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So sin will always bring a sense of shame into your life. Um, When I think especially of sexual sin, that's one of the ones that bring people into the most feelings of shame. I remember a fellow came to me once and he had opened up about the sexual problem and in his life and he'd done something wrong. And he'd asked God for forgiveness countless, countless times. And he wasn't doing it again. He wasn't in this behavior. But he just was so wrapped up in guilt and so wrapped up in shame. And we just said to him, have you ever forgiven yourself? You know, God has forgiven you. Are you able to forgive yourself of the shame? And he says, I've never heard that before. And so he just said, God, I choose today to forgive myself because you've forgiven me. And as soon as he prayed that, he just says, this peace has now come into my life. It's just wonderful. So you find that that our sin sometimes brings an accompanying shame. And so Christians, it's possible for us to be forgiven of a sin, and yet you're carrying the shame of the sin for donkey's years. Isn't that quite true that's i find that's the case even in my own life and and what has to happen is you have to accept what god has done in your life and and um, as somebody once said whatever cannot be resolved god will dissolve which i quite like whatever you cannot resolve god will dissolve and i quite like that statement so there's shame that we sometimes carry because of our sin the second we thing that causes shame is suffering whenever we've suffered 
And Paul talks about this in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 2. He said, we had suffered before and were shamefully treated. So whenever there's abuse, or whether there's mistreatment or rejection, or people are horrible to you, that's what brings a sense of shame into your life. And so that's a major problem with many, many people who have suffered at the hands of others. They carry this shame, not because they did something wrong, but because something wrong was done to them. And so what we have to reassure those people is to say to them, you have done nothing wrong, but what was done to you was wrong. And that's why you feel shame. Because the devil comes and he pours shame on people. That's what he always does. I always grimace when you hear people, let's say on television, say, shame on you. I often think that's a horrible thing to say to somebody because shame is a horrible experience because you become self-conscious. You become sin-conscious. You become conscious of your own unloveliness or as you think it anyway. The final reason why many, many people feel ashamed, by the way, is stigma. It's stigma. And it's where you're judged by other people. Where you're judged. Where, Where somebody, particularly if they're an authority figure in your life, whether it's a parent whether it is a teacher, whether it's like a doctor or somebody that has authority in your life, they misuse their words and they hurt you by their words. And they say things about you that, let's say, you'll never achieve, you're not good looking, you're ugly, you're stupid. Um, You know, words like that. And those words, you know, people say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a downright lie. Because words are far, you know, bones can heal, but your spirit cannot. I'll give you two scriptures. Proverbs 12 and 18 talks about this. There is one who speaks like the piercing of the sword. You know, the Bible, when it uses that, that's just not metaphors. You know that. It's that the words that the person speaks to you, it's like you feel stabbed. And you're bleeding. And you've got an open wound in your life because of the words that someone spoke to you. I remember doing outreach one night, and there was a guy... And he got awful dogs abuse. I mean, it wasn't just abuse that you'd get from people telling you, oh, you're God's squad or holy rulers. What came out of that guy's mouth was total abuse. It was demonic by its nature. And the guy, the Christian who was on the receiving end, I could just see him as, as he was getting this. He was basically shrinking. I could see this guy who was very confident just shrinking all the way down by these words. They were just crushing him. And he just left that experience just deflated and down and he was wounded. He was very wounded. And he got a wee bit of prayer afterwards, and it was as if we asked God, just take out all the poison that came with those words. And it was as if God put an anesthetic into his spirit, and God healed all of that sort of negative words that were spoken over him. That God would say, no, what he said is not true, what I say of you is true. And God healed him. But I'll finish this with scripture. This is what I want in my life, and I hope you have it too. This Proverbs 12, 18 talks about the, he who speaks is like the patient of the sword. But the tongue of the wise promotes health. It's not a lovely scripture. The Bible says that God can give you wisdom that when you speak into a person's life, it brings healing. Physical, emotional, well, you know, that you meet them and they just say, I just love talking to you. And they don't know why they like talking to you, but the reason they like talking to you is because they get healed. They're experiencing healing as you're talking to them and listening. Another wee scripture about stigma. This is very interesting. Proverbs 15 and 4 talks about this. A wholesome or a healthy tongue is a tree of life. It it brings life into you. Whenever somebody is ministering into your life with, with healing words, it brings life into your spirit. Not death, but life. But this is the second part of it. But perverseness, which means vicious, cruel, or judgmental words, breaks the spirit. It breaks your spirit into pieces. And you feel crushed. Have you ever got that before? I can think of times where I've met people and, you know, that Alex Ferguson talked about giving them the hairdryer treatment. And boy, it's not nice. It's not nice. And you feel so small after that experience and you feel like you're broken into a thousand pieces. And that's God says, that's the power of words. And particularly judgment. And isn't it so interesting that Jesus has a big argument with these Pharisees here? And at the core of it is verse 15. And I want you to look at this because it's so interesting. John 8 and verse 15. This is what Jesus said to the Pharisees. You judge according to the flesh. You judge according to the flesh. 
that the charge that Jesus brought to the religious leaders of his day was, you're judgmental. You're very judgmental. And of course, you read the story beforehand where the little woman is caught in the act of adultery. She was in the wrong. She was ashamed because of her sin. She was ashamed because of how people treated her. But she also was ashamed because of the stigma being put upon her. And these Pharisees were putting the stigma on her. And of course, we could go into the whole affair and say, well, who was she sleeping with? How did they know unless they were, you know, peeping toms? How did they know unless one of their own was having the affair with this woman? How did they know to find her in bed with this man unless they were culpable? But they put this judgment on this woman. And Jesus doesn't tolerate it. He says, I hate that. Because you see, as I said there from those verses in Proverbs, whenever somebody is judged, it breaks them, it stabs them, it hurts them. And Jesus wouldn't tolerate that. I I just love how much Jesus cares for the little guy. I really love that about Jesus. He really cares for people and he hates that people are abused. I remember many times you'd hear maybe Jim Hagan pray for somebody and he prayed it once and I thought, oh, that doesn't sound right. He would say, I want you to know that Jesus is very sorry for what happened to you. I was thinking when I first heard that, I, you know, self-righteously, I thought, who's Jesus to apologize to anybody, you know? But no, it's very true. Jesus is very, very sorry how people are treated. Very sorry for how people are treated, especially when words are used to hurt them. He doesn't like that. And we see this here. This wee woman, Jesus helps her. And he turns to the Pharisees and as it were, the wrath of Jesus is let loose against these men. And he says, you judge people according to the flesh. You judge people all the time and I do not like it. Now this is a question I think is very worthwhile answering for all of us. Why is it that religion is always judgmental? Why, why is it that religious people are judgmental? You know, we sometimes just say, oh, they're just religious and judgmental. But why are they? You know, I, I often, I have a wee inner toddler I like to think sometimes. And the wee and a toddler ask questions of, well, why? As my mother was tortured, you can understand. But to this day, probably you are being tortured now. But I ask these questions, why did they do it? And I can think of three reasons, very simply, three reasons why religious people are very judgmental. And it's because they're broken, as we'll see. The first reason why many religious people are judgmental is because they're proud. They're very proud people. And of course, the Pharisees were proud. Now, They were not proud of money because they thought money maybe wasn't too clean. They they were not proud of, you know, education, although many of them were well educated. What they were proud of was their spirituality and their rightness. They took God's righteousness and they made it into self-righteousness. And that's what Pharisees do. That's what religious people do all the time. They're proud Not of many, many things that worldly people are proud of. But what they're proud of is how they pray. They're proud about how they know stuff. They're proud about how they live. They're proud about their standards. They're proud about how they can keep the rules. And that's what typically religious people are very like. They're so proud of how they're right and everybody else is wrong. And I'm very disturbed sometimes when you go to sort of, you know, revival churches that, you know, they're all singing and dancing and liberated and speaking in tongues and healings and prophecies and everything's jolly good and all that. But there's still a religious spirit in the midst of the place. And you might say, well, how can you say that? Because they hammer somebody up the road. <laughs> you know, the, Derek Prince talked about it. He says it was one of the most ghastly things he ever saw was going to a, a full gospel businessman's convention and the banner at the back said, we have it all. <laughs> we have it all. And he says, what a joke. (laughs) What a joke. Because they didn't. But they said, well, we're not Anglicans and we're not Presbyterians and we're not Catholics and we're not Methodists and we've got something that they don't have so that makes us better. That's that's the heart of it. I mean, there's pride. It's what uh, Gore Vidal used to talk about. It's not enough to win, he said. The other guy has to lose. It's not enough that I win. The other guy has to have his real nose in it. And proud people are very, very unhappy if somebody else succeeds. I was talking to Christians this morning on a thing. And you read about this, I think it's in Luke chapter 10. And you read about how Jesus rejoiced in spirit. Do you know what he was rejoicing over? Another person's success. When was the last time you and I rejoiced over somebody else's success? You know, proud people can never do that. They're always miserable. (laughs) 
You know, they look at another person's success and say, I hate that person. <laughs> I really hate them. <laughs> and religious people are like that. Religious Christians are like that. They cannot cope with the church up the road being blessed. They think only God will work in our sphere. And that's a really bad attitude. So pride is one of the things why people are judgmental. The secondary reason is this, is that religious people are always afraid. They're terrified. If you want to find a group of people that are scared out of their minds, religious people are those. They're scared. Now, this is interesting. Okay, I'll ask you a question. Why do people keep rules? Why, why do we keep rules by nature? I mean, when you really think of it, it's a really strange thing human beings do. We keep rules all the time. Well, you know why we keep rules? Fear of punishment. He's hit the nail right on the head. Bonus points to him. (laughs) We're terrified of being punished and to be rejected. Because if you break the rules, you're kicked out of community. And that's how people think. But here's another question. Why do people break rules? The fear of rejection. You might say, well, how is that? I was talking to two teenagers this week at the mission, and it was wonderful, two Christian young men, and they came to me and said, how can we bring our friends to know Jesus? How can we share the gospel? And uh, they talked to me a little bit, and I said, well, tell me about one of your friends that you want to reach. He says, he's always getting expelled from school. And I said, that's really interesting. And they said, well, why is that? I said, that young fella doesn't feel loved. That's why he's doing it, because he's trying to break rules to get attention because he's been rejected in his life, and he doesn't want rejected again. And so what that guy needs is not to be disciplined or punished. He needs to be loved. And as soon as God heals that lovelessness that's in his heart, he doesn't want to break the rules, not because he wants to fit in, but because he feels whole. And so isn't it a really, really funny world that we live in? We have law keepers and law breakers, and the thing that joins them together is the fear of being rejected. So the law keeper says, I have to keep the law. Oh, be be, be very careful, right? Because I don't want anybody to think that I'm a bad person and that you won't love me. right? That's what goes through our mind. But you see, the lawbreaker says, I've already been rejected, so I'm going to reject you before you reject me again. So, you know, I was about to say what they would say, but, you know, <laughs> you, you can do the rest in your mind, right? But it's saying, I reject you before you reject me. And so whenever you come across one of these hell's angels or one of these guys that, you know, are spitting nails, uh, you know, against you, just think a wee minute, there's a lonely little boy or a lonely little girl there. And all they're looking for is someone to say, God loves you. And that could open up their hearts just like that. And so religious people are desperately afraid. They're afraid of being rejected because they don't know the love of God in their hearts. So that's one reason as well. The third wee reason is that religious people are very insecure. They're very insecure people. They don't know their identity in Jesus. They don't know their identity in God, and so they get their identity from other things. For example, they get their identity from their denomination. I went to a door um, two weeks back. I knocked the door, and I said, we're holding a gospel mission, and this lady, I'm not being judgmental, but maybe I am, um, I wondered what was keeping this woman alive. Let's put it like that. (laughs) She was skeletal. She just looked death warmed up would be the phrase I would use. And I said, we're holding me gospel mission and be delighted to have you. I'm Church of Ireland. Shut the door. That's a deeply insecure person. That's a deeply insecure person. She's not saved, obviously, because when you talk about Jesus, she says, I belong to a church that preaches Jesus. How that works, I don't know. But her identity was her church. And there's people who are like that. I'm a I'm Baptist, I'm Pentecostal, I'm charismatic. And that's always insecure. It's always insecure. Religious people like to be defined by their doctrines. I'm a Calvinist. I'm an Arminian. I'm a dispensationalist. I'm an amillennialist, premillennialist, postmillennialist, panmillennialist, whatever else you want to put in. I'm all these things. And what they're saying is, this is my identity. And you sort of wonder, is Jesus not enough for you? I mean, is he not sufficient? There's other people, and they're obviously insecure because they like to be defined by their deeds, by their actions. They pray a lot, they give to missions, they do a lot of activity, and as soon as you strip that away, they become empty shells. That's why you find an awful lot of people who do ministry are insecure people. You know, there's an awful lot of people get into pulpits, and the reason they're doing it is to prove themselves. They're really insecure people, and they just want people to come to them and say, You're okay, <laughs> you're all right, 
And says, yeah, I'm all right then, you know. But you know what insecure people then do? Remember the Pharisee in Luke 18? What did he pray when he was in the temple? I thank you, God, that I am not like these people. And you know what insecure people always need? A fall guy. They always need someone to be less than them, worse than them, and somebody that's not good as them. And religious people, that's why they judge. So they judge people because they're proud, because they're afraid of being rejected, so they judge you before you can judge them, and also because they're insecure. And hence, that's why they judge people. Now, let's look at the flip side. What does Jesus say there in John 8 and 15? I find this statement absolutely marvelous. I hope you do as well. John chapter 8 and verse 15 Jesus says these four words, I judge no one. Isn't that a remarkable thing from Jesus? That Jesus lived for 33 and a half years and he says, I've never judged a single person. I I just, I don't know about you. Do you not find that interesting? No, it's just me, maybe. (laughs) I I find that not incredible because it is believable, but I do find it amazing that Jesus would be able to practice such a ministry where he says, I do not judge people. So like, let's say, for example, right, what has happened in churches? Somebody comes in with, you know, multicolored hair, a nose ring, and a big tattoo, you know, all over their faces. What does everybody do in the traditional church? Turns around and looks at them and says, you see that? Jesus would have been the first person to greet that person and says, really good to see you. Isn't that how, I mean, when you don't judge someone, I mean, you don't judge them on their appearance. You don't look what they, you know, where we say, well, they're a wee bit, you know, I, I'm the, uh, right, I'm putting my hands up. I said the woman looked like Skeletor. I'm sorry. But that's what she did look like. And it maybe didn't help as well that she was nasty to me. So she stuck in my mind. <laughs> but, you know, Jesus wouldn't have judged someone, let's say, for their weight, for their looks, for what they were, their appearance or how they dressed. He didn't judge people. He just said, Do you know what Jesus saw in every person? He saw the image of God. Isn't that lovely? There's another thing we judge people on is their background. Are they usans or themans? What side of the house? What foot do they kick with? You know, how many metaphors did we come up with in the troubles to sort of, so to say, they're of a different religious persuasion than I? (laughs) But that's what people did. And it's all about, well, I'm going to judge you, you know, and uh, if you're from that background, this means this. You know, isn't that how it is? You know, for instance, why is it Indian people get a bad name among Westerners like us? The reason why Indian people are attacked and mocked sometimes is because it's the one guy who rings you on a Saturday morning, you run out of bed, you pick up the phone and says, I'd like to talk to you about BT and, uh, you know, telephone line. And you're sent an Indian. And that, isn't that how we behave? And we judge someone on the basis of a negative experience and we say, well, they're all like that. Or you sort of say, well, I met a Protestant once and all Protestants are like that. Or I met a Catholic, they're all like that. I met a gay person, they're all like that. And, and, we, and we judge a person, we judge a people by a person. And we do it even before we got saved. We judge Christianity by a Christian we met, which is never good. Jesus never judged someone on the basis of their background. But the other thing we judge people on is their lifestyle, how they live. And we say, there, you see them, don't live right, and they're all this. Jesus never judged anybody by lifestyle. Look at that there in John 8. And... Uh, Let's say verse 11. There's a woman caught in an act of adultery. Has she repented? Has she said, Lord Jesus, forgive me? Has she said, I've done wrong? None of that's mentioned. But what does Jesus say in verse 11? I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. What evangelicals do in our country is go and sin no more and I won't condemn you. That's how we do it. But Jesus said, no, no, I'm giving you no condemnation. I'm giving you a little foretaste of what it means to be a Christian. And you know what my kingdom's all about, so that you would be given an incentive not to sin. We bat them over the head and say, don't sin, don't sin, so we can get into God's kingdom. And it's counterproductive. It's putting the cart before the horse. So I want you to think about this for a wee second. Every person that Jesus met, how did he treat them? First and foremost, as I say, he never judged them. He never judged them on anything at all. I was reading that recently, and I just love it. You know, John 4, this, the woman at the well, right? What did, the, Samar- what did uh, sorry, the disciples see when they saw that woman? She's a serial divorcee. She's you know, obviously not walking right with God. What did Jesus see? A fountain of living water. 
Isn't that lovely? You know, they just saw all the dirt and the mire and the muck, and what Jesus saw was, no, that life could be full of the Holy Spirit. When, when the disciples walked through Samaria, they, they called it a hell hole. I mean, Samara, the Samaritans were demon-possessed, mad people in their minds. Jesus saw a harvest. It's a totally different way of thinking. And I think God needs to change our way of thinking, friends, because if we are going to see God move in supernatural power, I think you're going to have to totally change the way you think about people. You're going to have to totally change the way, even even the best of us, now, I'm not saying this hall's critical, I mean, you're not. I mean, you, you can cope with me most of the days, you know, without giving off too much. But I mean, you, you see what I mean, is that even the best of us here tonight are very judgmental in some ways. And that's so against Jesus. And so if we want to see the greater works of Jesus, we have to have the mindset of Jesus. Every person that Jesus met, he honored them. Isn't that, isn't that something that he did? He treated them as an image of God. I'll give you an example, not of Jesus, but I love this story. Two Christians were out in the streets evangelizing. One Christian turns to the other and says, see that woman, she's a prostitute. The other Christian replied, he said, no, she's a woman who's in prostitution. Completely different way of looking at a person. Completely different way. But that's the mind of Jesus. That's how Jesus views people. Not by their sin, not by what they've done or not done. He sees them as a person. And so we have to do the same. And Jesus treated everybody with great respect. Now, for instance, there are times where Jesus, you know, was mistreated by people. Now, I'm honest with this. On Friday night past, we went to a door. or went, Sorry, I didn't go to a door. We happened to, Hazel and myself were out in the car, and she said, I want to go and talk to this man. We're in Coal Island. And uh, she, she ran up to him. And she said, I'd like to invite you to the meeting. And he said, I don't believe in dead Jews. That's all he said and walked off. And there's a part of me was so angry. I just said, you are an ignoramus. You are a... You're so... I'm just going to be so cross with you because you mistreated my wife. But also, you're just so ignorant. You're so rude. And oh, kick your head. You know, that was... You know, that's literally what rises in our hearts. It's anger and and maybe it's, you know, an anger for God's glory. I don't know, right? But this is what Jesus said one day in John 12 and 47. And this has convicted me tonight. If any man hears my words and does not believe them, I don't judge him. It's not an extraordinary statement from Jesus. that, That you could be a Christ rejecter and hate the word of God and hate everything to do with Jesus. And Jesus says, I don't judge you. But he does say, for I have not come to judge the world, but to save it. He goes on to say, however, on the day of judgment, my words will speak against you, though. So he does tell us there is a judgment ultimately. But that's a totally different way of how Jesus treated people. And Jesus makes it plain, I don't judge anybody. Now, what I want to wrap this up tonight on very, very quickly is the invitation that Jesus gives to you and to me to experience something that I think is going to change us and is going to change this we hall tonight. And it's found in verse 12. Do you notice that it's a really unusual thing? I read this for donkey's years and I said, why does Jesus, after not condemning someone, talk about, I am the light of the world? You know, you read that there in verse 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And I go, I mean, yeah, I understand what it's trying to say, but what? Anyway, connection is that to the previous statement. And then when you break in at verse 20 there even at the end of it, it says these words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And I'm like, well, like, what is this all about, John? I mean, many times I read the Gospel of John in the past and I didn't like John. I'm honest with you. I, I was a real Paul man. I, I could understand Paul. He's all systematic and line upon line and all the rest. John's just talking in circles in my mind until this year God showed me this is why you haven't appreciated the gospel, of, uh, the gospel of John. Paul was the theologian. You could understand the theologian. Peter was the activist. You could grasp the activist. But John was the Jewish mystic. It's a totally different way of thinking. And you have to change your way of perceiving it and taking it on board. So John's mystical, and that's how he writes. He writes in, as a man experiencing truth. But this is what I want to talk about here in verse 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he talks about this event after not condemning somebody. And he says this in the middle of the temple. What's this all about? What is this all about? You have to have the Jewish mystic head on here. 
Anybody heard of an event in Jewish tradition called the illumination of the temple? Anybody heard of that? The illumination of the temple was a feast or a festival or a tradition or a custom, if you want to put it like that, that the Jews used to have every September, October time during what we call the Feast of Tabernacles. They built little, you know, huts, the tabernacles were to commemorate how God had looked after them um, during the wilderness years and how they were brought into the promised land. But this is what happened at the illumination of the temple. For every night for seven days, there were four candelabras in the outer court of the temple, in the treasury. They were 45 foot tall, each one of them. And as dusk was beginning to settle, the priests would light the four candelabras in the court of women, which is interesting, and also known as the court of the treasury. And this outer court, the history tells us that the the light would shine and the light would fill the whole city of Jerusalem. It was beautiful to see. In fact, people said, because of the light shining in different directions, it looked like the temple was a diamond. That was the literal historical reference. It looked like a diamond. And as as they lit these four candelabras, the women uh, would be stationed in the balconies overlooking this, right? They were all looking around at this uh, beautiful court scene full of light. And what would happen was that the priests and the men, godly men, would start dancing in the middle of the scene. Night after night they would do this. And they would dance and dance and dance. And they would play instruments and they would worship the Lord all night long. And the light would shine all night long. You might say, well, why did they do that? For this, two reasons. They were celebrating the light of all lights, which was the Shekinah glory of God in their midst. When Solomon had opened the temple, the Bible says the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And so they put up these candelabras and everybody was watching and the whole of the area was being affected because the glory of God had come into the temple. That's what they were celebrating. But what they were looking forward to was what they called was the great light himself. Who Isaiah prophesied that a light would shine into the darkness And those in darkness would see a great light. It was for the arrival of the Messiah. Jesus, in the midst of this festival time, says, this is all about me. I am the light that shines into the darkness. My presence is the glory that fills this temple. That I am the one who shines into this city. And I want you to take this on board a little minute here, right? It says it's shone like a diamond. Well, what happens when light is reflected off a diamond? What's the colors that are produced? A rainbow. Mercy. Why did Jesus say, I am the light of the world after showing mercy towards a woman? He says, I am the God of the rainbow. I am the God of mercy towards those who are condemned and under judgment. And I want my mercy to flood the city. I want my mercy to be seen for miles and miles on end. You religious people are quenching my light through judgment. So this is what I'm bringing before you this evening as the thought. Whenever the glory of the Lord fills the temple, it has to be in the context of mercy. It mustn't be tinged with judgment. When God's glory comes, it's like God says it on this condition. You must be merciful to people that are different in their appearance, different in their background, who have made mistakes in their lifestyle. And when the glory of God comes, there must be no judgment mixed in it at all. That's how his glory is able to touch people. You see, friends, why is it our churches are not impacting cities? Why is it that we're not able to break out, that the light would break out into the city like it was here in this illumination of the temple? For this reason, we are not embodying the light of the world who forgives and shows mercy and does not condemn the sinner. And we're able to show honor and love and and go to somebody as they come and just say, it's so good to see you here tonight. I I was loving it on Friday evening. There was a fellow came to the mission and I came to him and I genuinely met it. I said, it's so good to see you. So good to see you here. And he says, really? Really? You know? And 
And there's something about when you and I begin to show the light of the world in all of its refracted glory and rainbow color, technicolor brilliance, there's a sense in which people will get the light into their hearts far quicker than through judgment. That's what Jesus is talking about. He wants to come, and this is what goes on a little further. He says, I am the light, and my presence wants to saturate cities. So whenever you and I as Christians begin to prize mercy, and we don't condemn, and we don't judge, and we're not, we don't judge the sinner, but we say it's sin is wrong at the same time, but our primary heart and primary instinct is mercy, what we are doing is welcoming the light of the world into this place, And the light can break out into the community and people can be drawn to that light. And people that are in the darkness, people that are ashamed, people that are guilty, people that have done shameful things in their lives, people that have experienced shameful things in their lives, people that have been judged for shameful things in their lives, that those people can look at the light and say, this light is protective. I'll feel safe in this light. See what I mean? Most people, when they come into churches, they're putting their tin hat on. They're coming all defensive. They're like big hedgehogs. And all the spikes are out and says, don't you touch me because you're going to hurt me. And they're ashamed. But when Jesus, the light of the world, is welcomed into this place and we banish all forms of judgment, people in the shadows, people in the darkness can come into the light. And this is the good bit. They can start to dance. They can start to sing. They can start to have a freedom in their lives. That they're not afraid of people, you know, they're not afraid of being exposed and saying, I really love Jesus now. Isn't that what you want to see? You know, like, like, like crack addicts that are, that are bound by shame and abuse and all this stuff, that they get saved and they get healed and they get delivered of all these things. And they're dancing and waving flags. You know, they'll have to take the flags out of Jim Stewart's hand and say, Jim, now the rest of us have to have a turn, Jim. See what I mean? That these lives are being transformed because they're in the presence of the light. They're in the presence of the, of the illuminated temple. The light of the world is here. And whenever the light of the world and people come under that light, they get free. They have to admit they're sinners, of course. They have to admit they have a problem. But that's what Jesus wants to bring them to. That they could sing and dance and praise him all day long. Because he set them gloriously free. That's what the context is of this word. Maybe you, have you ever heard that before? No. So Jesus totally and utterly shows mercy towards this undeserving woman who was being judged by everybody religiously. And Jesus breaks and says, I am the light of the world. I am the four candelabras. And wherever my presence is, I can bring shameful people out of the darkness and shadows into my presence. They'll be welcome into my house. And in my house, they'll discover joy and freedom and liberty. And they will dance. And the good thing about this light is that it will not go out in the morning. This light will shine forever if you as Christians are willing to facilitate that light. That's what Jesus is bringing out in John 8. And guess what happens when you begin to speak about entertaining or or hosting that type of presence of, 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 of holiness and purity. Yes, it's always light. Holiness is always there, but... But look, it's a place where people can come and not be judged and they can come and be set free. Do you know the first thing that will come your way and I'm giving you a forewarning. I'm not saying it's a prophecy but I'm just saying, look at this. As soon as Jesus says, I am the light of the world, what do the guys say in verse 13? The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. This isn't of God. <laughs> isn't that how it works? Wherever the broken people come in, what do they say? False converts. Emotionalism. Uh, the manipulation, it's, it's just, you know, mind control or, or it's, it's demonic or it's counterfeit. So I'm giving you a little heads up on that one. So that maybe in a couple of weeks or months or whenever God does this stuff, you can turn and say, thanks, David, for the heads up on that one. Because that's what happens when the light of the world comes and he stands in our midst. The power of judgment is broken. Mercy reigns. People in the shadows can come. All of their shame and all their baggage. And Jesus will take all the shame away. And these shameful hearts will begin to shout and praise and rejoice again. That's what Jesus would love to do here. And that's what I believe he wants to do maybe with you tonight. Maybe you're carrying shame. He wants you to come out of the darkness. Just to say, yeah, I've got darkness. I've got problems. But he wants to cast off all that shame. And what he wants to do is to cause you to dance again. So the old hymn by Mark, Robin Mark says, let these broken, weary bones rise to dance again. 
that these dry and thirsty land with a river. Lord, our eyes are fixed on you and we are waiting for the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Maybe also here tonight you've been quite judgmental. I'll be the first in that queue to apologize on that one. But friends, let's just break off the power of judgment tonight as we pray here. Let's just really do that. And let's become people of mercy. Because that will change lives. Father, we're just coming before you tonight and you've told us if we have seen Jesus, we have seen the Father. That you have said the best advertisement of you, Father, was Jesus. And you said, Father, by extension through Jesus, I do not judge anyone. You're the God who burns fear and burns rejection and burns shame off our shoulders. We love that about you, Father. We love that, Lord, literally now we we can feel it, Lord, that you're burning shame off people, Father, because your presence is ministering. And Father, we just come and just say, Lord, increase your presence here right now. Increase your, your fiery presence, your healing presence here. Revisit experiences of shame delicately and gently and just say, I'm taking you away, my beloved. I'm taking you away from areas where you felt ashamed because of your own sin. Where you felt ashamed because of what people did to you. You're ashamed because of what people have said over you. And yet, Lord Jesus, you're inviting us to a dance. We just say, Lord, how unreligious, how wonderfully unreligious this is, Jesus. You're inviting us into your courtyard today. And I just pray for people that are ashamed here, Lord, for whatever reason, would you just draw them into your courtyard tonight? Let the light shine over them, not to hurt them or to chase them away, but to say, you're welcome here. Your shame can be left at the door. And now you will start to dance again. You'll start to sing again. You'll start to praise again. And I just want to come before us, Lord, tonight as as a group of your people. And we want to repent of all forms of judgment. Everything in our attitudes, everything in our words, everything that we have carried. And we've just put judgment on people and we've dimmed the presence of God. I just want to pray that Lock Brickland would not be synonymous with judgment. I repent of the legacy of judgment that's been in this place. For many years, Lord, where people were judged for their clothes, judged for what Bible they use, judged for whatever. We just repent of all that. We just want to break that off, Lord God, in Jesus' name. That, Lord, this would be known as a house of mercy. A house of mercy. Where it doesn't matter what you've done. doesn't matter what's happened. doesn't matter what has been said. There's mercy with the Lord. And so, Father, I just want to pray, Lord, as... As only you can, would you take this wee word tonight and plant it into our hearts and protect it and incubate it and and let it grow, Lord. Because, Lord, I believe that there's people that you want to bring to this wee hall. And my Father, Lord God, they, they, they don't believe that religion can help them. And we don't want to offer them religion for it won't help them. But we want to offer the light of your presence that will bring healing, the eradication of shame, and the beginning of celebrations. We thank you, Father, for all these things now. In Jesus' name, amen.